Honourable Member for Battle River Crawford. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and it is an honour to be able to enter into the, to the debate on this, this throne speech and, quite frankly, express some very, very, seri very serious concerns that I have with it. You know, the throne speech, at least in English, was nearly 7,000 words, many catchphrases and talking points, but little, very little substance. Madam Speaker, there's two themes that I'd like to address, first of which is why the government felt that it was even necessary to have a throne speech. And second, I would like to point out some specific challenges I have with the throne speech itself. Regarding the prorogation of Parliament, I find it incredible, incredibly disturbing, that this government felt that they should shut down Parliament, not just with the prorogation. It was bad enough the last eight months. But then, in the middle of, of, of several concurrent investigations into this Prime Minister's conduct, to shut down the ability for committees, to shut down the ability of members of Parliament, and to shut down the ability of Canadians, truly. For there is one place in this country that allows all Canadians' voices to be represented, and that is within the hollowed walls of this chamber. This Prime Minister, in an extraordinary abuse of executive authority, used a legitimate parliamentary mechanism to shut down investigations into his own conduct. That, Madam Speaker, is shameful. Yet, unfortunately, not surprising, we saw, first after several months of denial and, and, and flip-flopping, that when the government finally figured out, I think it was March 13th, when the government figured out that the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, as it was referred to at the time, was actually serious, even though certainly members of my party had been bringing up concerns about why there weren't increased measures at airports, why there weren't other, other uh, uh, actions being taken to ensure that Canada would be better prepared to deal with the threat of a global pandemic. The government changed course, and we saw the first bill, some emergency relief measures brought forward, yet Instead of it being simply about emergency relief, it was about an incredible abuse of executive power. We saw an attempted power grab that, certainly unlike anything that I have seen in this country's history, the government wanted unlimited spending authority for more than a year and a half. In what democracy would that ever be deemed acceptable to even propose, let alone justify it in the midst of a global pandemic. When Canadians deserved and needed help, this government looked out for nothing other than their own power. Unbelievable. And for those members opposite who are curious about some of the aspects of parliamentary procedure and saying, well, we needed this to be a legislative reset. In fact, I asked a question to um, one of the members from the Liberal Party here just a few minutes ago, and he somehow suggested that it was necessary, that six weeks was necessary, in order to ensure that, that they could consult with Canadians on the throne speech. And you know what, it's interesting, he mentioned a few examples about how he did town halls and whatnot, and to suggest that other members weren't talking to their constituents is quite frankly insulting. And he asked me to respond, so I will respond. But I didn't have a chance during the questions and comments. It is unbelievable and speaks to the liberal elitist mentality that they would suggest that somehow their prorogation allowed them to have an inside track on influencing the future of this country in a minority parliament. <laughs> they should well know that it is this place that allows all voices to be heard, not simply liberal party voices, for it was the conservatives that actually received more votes in the last election than the liberals. It was the Liberals that had a significantly reduced mandate after the last election. Yet, it seems that they have refused to accept the will of the Canadian people when it comes to their place in Parliament and the fact that Parliament is truly an essential service. And my last point on uh, the, the uh, uh, concerns around why we have a throne speech today that this government seems to play, play quick and fast with all aspects of how they do business, whether it be manufacturing urgency with the passing of Bill C-2, 
We could have been debating this for weeks, and it could have been passed weeks ahead of the deadline, yet they wait till the 11th hour and then, then, then show up at a press conference and the House, their House leader tweets out saying, this is a confidence motion. It must be passed or else we go to an election and Canadians will suffer as a result. Yet it was circumstances manufactured by that government. Typical liberal elitism. So, Madam Speaker, I digress in that regard and would like to move on to some of the serious concerns that I have with the throne speech. I summed it up simply to my constituents when they asked me in a sentence or two to describe what my feelings on it were. And I said it's simple. It's vague, it's expensive, and it's Ottawa knows best. On the vague aspect of it, there were few concrete measures. You know, they talked about their four pillars of a recovery. They have lots of catchphrases and slogans. And I'll tell you, if, if there was an award for catchphrases and slogans, I think this government would get it. Because they seem to be copying from various campaigns, in fact, even other uh, election campaigns from other democracies around the world. They just use these catchphrases to throw in and hope that people will somehow believe that catchphrases get the job done. Well, on this side of the House, we know that's not the case. It is unfortunate that most of the, 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 the aspects of the throne speech are simply recycled liberal promises. And I point to one, uh, one example, and it's that of their promise to plant two billion trees. You know, they promised this in the last election. And yet, uh, in the year that has passed, Madam Speaker, they've planted zero. They have planted zero. Yet, we have an oil sands company that's planted millions. And it is that sort of, uh, uh, that, that speaks to the bigger context of this throne speech. Many promises, many of them recycled, that they somehow how, how seem to think that making these grand promises, but no plan for delivery, somehow serves Canadians' best interests. And that's simply not the case. There, that is one of many examples. In fact, you know, the, the, the one example that uh, what, what could have been an opportunity to see many specific, concrete uh, 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 paths forward for our country, we saw very, very few. And that's unfortunate. Huge missed opportunity. And further, it seemed to be a vanity project for this Prime Minister, because not only did he prorogue Parliament for six weeks, have the Governor General read a throne speech significant aspect of our parliamentary tradition that takes the focus out of the politics of the country and allows our head of state, the representative of our head of state, to outline an agenda. Yet that wasn't good enough for this Prime Minister. I see my time is short and I have a lot more to say on this subject, but, but that wasn't good enough for this Prime Minister. This Prime Minister had to have his face on television to continue his story, uh, a trend of, of Cottage Chronicles, to have a televised address which simply, again, repeated things. So, Madam Speaker, as my time is running out, and I look forward to the questions and comments, but certainly there's much, and some of which I've addressed in other speeches like the unity crisis, the fact that we're six months into a fiscal year, and I know many of the people that work in the Jim Flaherty building down the street named after a former Conservative uh, finance minister. Incredibly intelligent and capable finance people in the department, yet our Minister of Finance yesterday said that it wouldn't be prudent to estimate what the deficit is going to be. Well, I know many of the people in that finance department have a good idea. I suspect it has more to do with the fact that they're scared of what Canadians will think when they find out the cost and the lack of accounting associated with their spending. At a time when Canadians, all Canadians, know that we need to support those who need it, yet to do so without a plan is very, very unfortunate. My last point is this. The Ottawa Knows Best mentality is best represented on page 18 of the throne speech, where in talking about a national pharmacare strategy, the Liberals use a word when talking about working with provinces to develop their pharmacare plan, of which there's no detail. They say that they will only work with willing provinces and territories. Madam Speaker, when it comes to this government, it's clear 
that they're only willing to work with those who are willing to fall in line with their narrow ideology and perspectives on what the future of our country should look like. And, Madam, that is driving wedges across our country that are harming the, the, the capacity and the capability of Canadians to succeed. Questions and commentaires. Questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Let me take, uh, take the member at uh, a question based on his uh, first five or so minutes of his speech when he talked about the prorogation of, of Parliament. And it's interesting, you know, we were supposed to come back on September 21. The member's right. Two days. Instead of coming back on September 21, we came back on September 23. We also, for the first time in 30 plus years, sat uh, days in here. We were asking questions, literally hundreds, if not even going into thousands of questions that were asked of the government by opposition, and understandably so. My question is, why does the member believe that it was wrong for the government of Canada to prorogue, yet the home province of Manitoba has done just that? They've prorogued. Is the Progressive Conservative Premier wrong in Manitoba to have prorogued? The member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I always appreciate when, uh, when the Parliamentary Secretary asks a question. In fact, I find it interesting that he's done two speeches on the throne speech, and it seems to be the one that is really only, tru only tr truly willing to defend their own government's record when there's many other members that uh, don't seem to be willing to ask certainly members on this side questions about it. Regarding the prorogation and many of the questions that we were able to ask, it, it speaks to the government's attitude. All style, no substance. They were happy to have a question period, you didn't want Parliament to actually, actually do the tough work. You know, when it comes to the prorogation, many provinces prorogue on a regular basis. But it could have been a prorogation simply on the order paper of that day. In fact, in most provinces, that's what you'll see. You'll have a, a legislature come and sit in the morning, they'll prorogue so that the, the lieutenant governor can do a throne speech in the afternoon. Questions and comments. The Honourable Deputy Pierre Boucher, the Pierre Boucher, the Patriot Versailles. The Honourable Member. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Well, thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I'd like to congratulate my colleague for his uh, interesting and passionate speech. Listening to him, I could have perhaps uh, pronounced uh, 80 to 90 percent of the speech myself, so it's surprising to see just how much we agree on certain issues. When it comes to the We Charity, for example, where the government uh, shut down committees and parliament, a throne speech which didn't teach us anything, it just repeated some old liberal promises, recycled them, or an address to the nation where we were told to wash our hands. So it's quite a show they put, tried to put on. But at the same time, there was one point that I didn't agree with in his speech. When he talked about certain oil companies, the oil companies did more for the environment than the Liberal government. Now, I agree on that, but would that be a reason? to rely on oil companies for the uh, climate change strategy. It seems to me that uh, we won't resolve uh, the problem if we do that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate uh, my colleague's question. And uh, I, you know, I love ta being able to address the environment when it comes to the fantastic record that Alberta has in this regard. I'm proud to come from a constituency that produces some of the most ethically and environmentally sound resources in the world, and that includes oil and gas. You know, we should be proud of the resources, the resource extraction technologies, the companies, and the record that we have as Canadians, especially when it comes to the reality that resources, carbon-based resources, oil and gas, are still going to be a part of the energy infrastructure needed in our world for many, many decades to come. Now, the Canadians are faced with a choice. We can have government policies like those which the government propose that force us to look elsewhere for oil and gas, to be import oil and gas from other jurisdictions that don't care about ethics, don't care about human rights, and don't care about the environment. Or we could have the most ethically, environmentally friendly produced oil done right here in Alberta, and that could be used all across the world. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for London Fenshaw. Uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, I, uh, I appreciate my, my colleague across the way's uh, frustration 
with this speech from the throne, I too am very frustrated. And I think it goes to um, the empty words, the empty promises, the lack of action that we've seen across the board. Specifically for me, uh, as the uh, critic for youth post-secondary education, that there wasn't a single mention of students. And, and he, he talked about a bit of the, of the WE scandal. And I, I know that New Democrats have been pushing for that $912 million, almost a billion dollars, to be put directly back into the hands of students. And I'd like him to comment on his frustrations on, on that as well. Thank you. Very, very short answer from the member of Battlefield. I'll, I'll try and make it short, Madam Speaker, although admittedly that's difficult. I agree. This clearly uh, speaks to how the government is great on announcing, but fails on delivery. To the Honourable Member for Vancouver-Granville. Well, thank you, uh, 